The Mutual Broadcasting System, in cooperation with Family Theater Incorporated, presents Mr. Bitterow's Mission, starring Chester Morris and Cecil Calloway, with the music of Meredith Wilson. Jack Haley is your host. More things are wrought by prayer than this world dreams of. Good evening. This is Jack Haley, your host on the Family Theater tonight. I imagine lots of you people are still a little puzzled about this program. You want to know what's behind it? Who puts it on? Who's the sponsor? Well, it's simple. Family Theater is put on by a group of people here in Hollywood who believe, as you do, in a wonderful ideal, a happy American family. Because we know that a happy family is the finest thing we can have. It's worth working for, worth fighting for, worth praying for. And it's because the skids are under that ideal and because lots of families aren't happy, aren't pulling together, that we feel the need for a program like this is vital. Notice how we started off. We said, more things are wrought by prayer than this world dreams of. That's the idea behind the family theater. We all share the simple conviction that prayer, family prayer, can keep our families happy. For a family that prays together, stays together. So don't be afraid. Ask God for his help. He won't let you down. I sat there in a little world of my own. I began to have that feeling which occurs to all of us at times, as though the days and weeks are rushing by too quickly and we're living in a dream, never fully aware or alert to the reality of what we're doing at the moment, and always pushing those thoughts away as all of us do when we think of death and what's going to happen to us after we die. I sat there and waited for the nurse to tell me to go in. All at once, I seemed to feel very wise, as if I'd been alive a long, long time, had seen everything there was to see, and knew everything there was to know. And then, curiously, I felt something trying to come to me, something I knew would be warm and comfortable if only I would let it through. And yet, uneasily, I forced it out of my consciousness. You may see the doctor now, Mr. Peters. And then I was on my feet. I opened the door to the doctor's office. <clears throat> Mr. Peters. Yes, Doctor. You've been taking these blood transfusions for six months now, is that right? What's the verdict, Doctor? I'm afraid your condition is very serious. Worse? Much worse. You can tell me, Doctor. As you know, you're suffering from a particularly vicious form of anemia, and there is no hope for a cure. Yes, I know. Um, how long do I have? You must take a blood transfusion daily from now on, instead of every second day. Yes, Doctor, but I want to know... You must give up working. Well, I've already done that, but I... How about your family? Do they... uh... I... I have no family. Elizabeth was the only one, and... Your wife? Yes. She's... She's been gone for almost three years. Doctor, I want to know how much longer I have. If you follow my instructions, perhaps three months. Three months. (laughs) Twelve weeks. If you do as I say. And, uh... If I don't? That's up to you. Excitement or exertion might bring the end at any time. I see. Well, thank you, Doctor. It feels rather good to know. As your doctor, Mr. Peters, I must insist that... I thank you, Doctor. But I'm afraid it's out of your hands now. Well, now I knew. And I could only think in my own little world of the things I must do. Curiously, I was neither frightened nor desperate. My mind was already made up how I would spend my remaining time. Now I was bound more closely to myself, withdrawing myself from the world and its people. But I knew that now I could no longer resist that pressure of warmth and comfort which I'd been fighting. For suddenly I became half aware of someone beside me. Well, Clyde? Hmm? Oh. You see me now? Um, yes, of course. And you can't force me into the background anymore, out of your thoughts. No, I guess not. You know, 
Back there in the doctor's office, I knew that you would be able to see me. But I didn't want to embarrass you because, of course, the, the good doctor couldn't see me. Oh, I, uh, I think I understand. Good. Where do we go from here? We? Yes. I'm going to be your companion from now on. What for? You're so near the end, Clyde. Nothing must happen to you. Who are you? My name? <laughs> My name is Bidero. James No, I, I, I don't care about your name. I, I want to know what you are. I'll tell you. Down. And strangely, down. I had only a half curiosity about the man. I found it difficult to get out of my shell of thoughts, the prison of my emotions. The little man seemed only half real. He had, he had curious gray eyes and a bright manner. And he seemed to take things in a light spirit. And yet there was something strange about him. He stood next to me in the elevator, and nobody seemed aware of him but myself. His legs stretched out as he kept pace with me. <laughs> That's another time I didn't want to embarrass you, Clyde. Those people in the elevator wouldn't understand if they heard you talking to no one in particular. Oh, then, then they can't hear you? No. Or feel you? No. But you asked what I am. Well, I, uh, never mind, Mr. Bedlow. Bidero, James R. Bidero. Oh. I had enough trouble with my, my name during my lifetime, and I thank you, too. Uh, what's the matter? It's just struck me, Clyde. You're not paying any attention to me. You're thinking about what you're going to do these next three months. These last three months, you mean? Next three months, Clyde. There's nothing final about them. I see. Well, whichever it is, I'm going to kill a man. Ah, uh, you see, Clyde, that's why I'm here. Quite a nice apartment you have here, Clyde. Lovely view. Oh, socks, uh, handkerchiefs, undershirts. Uh, um, Clyde. Toothbrush, razors, shaving lotion. Clyde, stop packing that bag and listen to me. I, I, I am listening. No, you're not. You've got your mind on other things. Perhaps I have. Oh, it's nice of you to admit it. But there are some things I want to take up with you. Oh? First, I want you to try and overcome your horror of death. Think of it as... I have no horror of death. You haven't? No. That's odd. It's never happened to me before. Are you quite sure? I don't even think of it. What do you think about? Well, I don't know if I can tell you exactly. It's a... It's a sort of an impatient thinking. It's about a man and how I'll kill him. Clyde, Clyde, what am I going to do with you? You must root this evil thing from your mind. You can't kill anybody. His name is Thomas L. Tanway. Tell me about it. Perhaps if you got it all off your chest, you'd feel better. No. You're being unreasonable. No. Shall I tell you? Do you know? Yes, of course. Well, then we'll leave it as it is. Um, would you mind sitting on top of the valise so I can fasten it? Uh, no. <laughs> you'd better do the sitting. Lack of weight, Clyde, you know. <laughs> I'll snap it shut. Oh, of course. It's here. Thanks. Not at all. Where are we going? Boston. What for? Tanway lives there. The doctor said you shouldn't exert yourself. He said you should, you should take things easy. But the doctor doesn't only have three months to live. Clyde. What? You mustn't do this thing. Nothing justifies the murder of another man. Perhaps not to you, but I feel perfectly justified. No, Clyde, there is no justification. That's my reason for being here. It's my responsibility to stop you. You cannot conceive the harm you will do yourself. It doesn't matter to me. It must matter. I must make you see that all your reactions now are not really normal, that your future is real, and that your remaining days here in this world should not interfere with that future. Oh, it's no use. Nothing can stop me. Clyde, there is a higher justice than the one you know. Yes, well, where is it then? Where has justice been all these years while well, Tanway hounded Elizabeth and me? Kept me from working, framed me into the penitentiary. Yes, these things do happen but they never see the light of day. Where has it been, this justice? While well, Tanway, by his continuous persecution, took Elizabeth's life. <laughs> that judge who sentenced me to jail, uh, Judge Clark, was he justice? No. That's why there's nothing in my mind but a feeling. And my dying doesn't mean a thing. Understand, Biederman? Biderow, 
Huh? I said Bidero, B-I-D-D-E-R-O-E. Oh, well, that's the story. That's all I'm living for now. To bring justice to Thomas Tanway. Hey, wait for me. Are you still coming along? Of course, I've got a job to do too, Clyde. To keep you from making a serious mistake. Do you think you can stop me? You can't. You can't! <laughs> I'd like to see Mr. Tanway, please. Your name, please? Uh, Clyde Peters. Do you have an appointment, Mr. Peters? No, I, uh, I'm an old, old friend of his. Oh, first door to the right. Thanks. Your name, please? Peters. Do you have an appointment with Mr. Tanway? I'm an old friend. You'll have to see Mr. Averill, then. Well, what did you want to see Mr. Tanway about? Perhaps I can help. I'm his assistant. I just wanted to see him. Uh, uh, will you tell him I'm here, please? Oh, well, uh, I'm afraid that's impossible. Mr. Tanway is on a holiday with Judge Clark and Ernest Thompson. Judge Clark? Well, you know him. Yes. Oh. Uh, well, they're hunting on Mr. Tanway's estate. Oh, yes. Tanway Woods. Uh, yes. I'm awfully sorry I can't help you. I knew he wouldn't be there. How did you know? Oh, just a feeling. Now we can give this thing up, Clyde. You're, you've tried and... I'm going to Tanway Woods. Now, Clyde, don't be obstinate. Don't forget your blood transfusion. I haven't forgotten. How can I? My body doesn't let me forget for a minute. I'm on my way to the hospital now, and then I'm going to find Tanway. I must say, Clyde, you, you chose the most uncomfortable vehicle you could find. Well, it was the only car to be had. I was lucky to get it. We've been on this dirt road two hours now, and you haven't had your transfusion yet. Do you know where we are? Yes. Well, I don't. Has Maine always been like this? In the late fall, yes. But in the spring, it's wonderful here. The fresh green of the trees is so vivid it almost makes you cry. And the air is so cool and clear and clean. You know, I spent my youth here. So did Elizabeth and... and Thomas. Hmm. Judge Clark, too. The one who sent you to jail. Oh, it wasn't his fault. He couldn't help himself. He told me so. That's your justice. That's your idea of compensation. Well, here we are. Uh, see the side of that mountain over there? Yes. Well, that's part of Tanway Woods. It extends over the mountain and across the valley. In a few weeks, it'll be white with snow. And the wind will roar down the valley and pile the loose drifts into huge caricatures. Good hunting, eh? Oh, yes, the best. Uh, there's the estate. Where? Over there, just beyond the gate. Uh, Clyde, how do you plan to do it? With a gun. A gun? Oh, yes, yes, that's, that's a good quick way. Do you feel all right? I'm tired. Well... Yeah? Here we are. Yes. I don't want you to interfere. <laughs> I can't. Physically. It's getting dark. Clyde, he's not here. I don't believe that I... Yes, sir? Oh, I'd, uh, I'd like to see Mr. Tanway, please. He's not in, sir. I'll wait if you don't mind. Was he expecting you, sir? He isn't coming back tonight. Oh. Is there anything I can do for you, sir? No, uh, no thanks. See? I told you. Now we can go back to the city. This country depresses me, Klein. I know where he is. Where? At the farm. Where's that? In the valley between the mountains over there. Why don't you give it up, Clyde? Can't you see how everything you try to do fails? You tried it at the office. You tried it here. <laughs> it's been that way all my life. Did you ever think there might be some divine purpose behind it? There is a great law of equalization and a balance to things pendulum which swings both ways. Well, this time I'll swing the pendulum the way I want it to go. You'll never make it across the mountain. You haven't had your transfusion today. Oh, I'm, I'm going to a doctor now. Oh? What doctor, may I inquire? I, I know of one in the village. Come in. Thank you. You're Dr. Sanford? Yes. I, uh, 
I hate to bother you, Doctor, but I'm afraid I need a blood transfusion. Of what? Are you wounded? No, no, I... Please, are you equipped for performing a transfusion? Why, I've never had occasion at a moment's notice See, here in the office, well, can you but... do it for me? I'm... See, I'm suffering from the advanced stages of pernicious anemia and I... Come into the office. Thank you. What's your blood type? Type AB. Good, and lucky, too. So is mine. Roll up your sleeve. Well, but isn't there somebody who... Nobody I can call on. Roll it up. Doctor, I can't tell you how... No need to. This is an emergency. Here, hold this a moment. There. Now, give me your arm. Yes, Doctor. Okay. Now tell me how you let yourself get in a fix like this. I... I didn't think I'd be in this fix. I expected to be back at the hospital in Junction City before now. How often do you take these? Every day. You must have overtaxed your strength. I presume you know you must not exert yourself in any way? Oh, yes, yes. Oh. What's the matter? I did... Nothing. I just caught a look at myself in the mirror on the wall. Startled you? Well, I advise you to do no more traveling this evening. If you like, I can find a room for you. Oh, no, no, thanks, Doctor. I've got to go on. But it's imperative that you do not. Here, I think we're about done. Hold still a moment. Thank you, Doctor. This transfusion won't do you a bit of good if you don't relax and rest yourself. I know, I know. How much do I owe you? Two dollars. Huh? Is that all? That's my regular fee for a call here. And if you value your life, you'll take it easy. You should be in bed. Value my life? <laughs> Thank you again, Doctor. You've been very kind. Goodbye. I'd seen my face in the mirror. It was a shock. I didn't recognize myself. I saw a stranger with thin gray hair and a thin lined face. The eyes burning and set in a chalky white face. I kept thinking about the face, seeing it. I couldn't get it out of my mind. You were lucky. You won't find a doctor like that in a thousand. How do you feel? Well, better. Tell me, Bedford, why don't you have any feeling about what's coming? Oh, I just don't, that's all. Oh, you wouldn't tell me even if you did have it. I have a job to do. You're making it very difficult for me. Well, this is the last lap. This is the last effort I have to make. This is the last thing I want to do. You can't stop me. You can't. Now, wait a second. Don't go so fast. It's dark. But you've got a long way to go, and you'll never make it. I'll make it. What about the two friends who are with him? I don't care about them. Careful now. Yeah, I know. There isn't even a path here. Oh, it'll be easier going down on the other side. Look out, you know, you, you almost stumbled on that roof. I know, I saw it. It's very dark here. You tired? Yes. Well, we can still go back. No. You would have surcease from pain and suffering. Believe me, this killing you're so intent upon will mean nothing to you later. It will not affect you or your peace of mind one bit when you're... No. You'll forget it, I'm sure you will. It'll mean nothing. And you will be glad that you triumphed over the desire for revenge. No. You will be my first failure, Clyde, if you persist. There's the top, right over there. Clyde. He's over there, on the other side. He's over there. Oh, oh, my legs. They, they feel so heavy. Rest a while, Clyde. Sit down on the log. No. Here we are, on the top. Why don't you rest and gather your strength? It's a long way down, Clyde. Do you hear me? Ankle. Twist it? Yeah. Yes, but I, th I think it's all right. Your strength is failing. Yes. You see the farm? It's not far now. Clyde, your strength is gone. You can't continue on heart alone. Your strength is gone. You can hardly breathe. Only, only a little while. And then, then it'll be over.
careful. Just a, just a little more. First you must rest here. Sit down. Catch your breath. Yes. Yes, I must rest. Yes. This is my last chance, Clyde. Will you listen to me? Yeah. Go ahead. No, I, I want you to listen to me. All right. I'm listening. What's my name? Oh, I don't know. It's uh, Bindle. No, no, you're not listening. You're not paying attention. All you can see and hear and feel, all the senses that make up your mind and heart, are concerned with this terrible thing. You must not kill Clyde. You mustn't. You're repeating yourself. There's the farm and Thomas. Lights on upstairs and downstairs. <laughs> I can hear the hum of the power plant. And it's cool. The coolness on my cheeks. Something strained and tight roaring in my head. Thank you, Bedlow. Who the devil it... Clyde. Clyde Peters. Well, who would have expected you? Haven't you been waiting for me, Thomas? I can't deny it. Come in. Come in. Sit down, Clyde. You don't look so good. Have some trouble getting here? Where are your friends? Upstairs. But what brings you here? I came to kill you, Thomas. Huh? <laughs> That's funny, Clyde. <laughs> yeah. They punish people for things like that. Remember? That no longer affects me. Well, you can stop your dramatics, Peters. What do you want? Money? No, Thomas. Not money. Not anything you have. Except your life. Are you serious? Yes, Thomas. How are you going to do it? My rifle's on the table. You're not even armed. I have a gun in my pocket. Before you make a move in that direction, you'll be dead. No, no, wait a minute, Peters. People, people just don't do these things. Not to you, Thomas. Not up to now, anyway. You see, I've wasted my life trying to fight against your money and influence. While I watched Elizabeth suffer. So that a thousand times I thought of killing you and myself. But I didn't have the courage. Didn't want to do anything that would hurt Elizabeth. You kept a sword over my head all this time. But now it's over your head, Thomas. <laughs> How does it feel? It isn't pleasant being aware of it, is it? Just think how it must have felt to me the last 25 years. Listen, I'll, I'll do anything, anything you say, but keep away from me. Anything, Thomas? Yes, yes, anything. I'll give you money. Do anything you say. Just don't shoot. Give me back Elizabeth, Thomas. Give me back all those years. Oh, wait a minute, Clyde. Uh, just a minute. Give me a chance. <laughs> For the first time in my life, I saw fear in Tanway's face. He didn't wear it well. He was no longer the man I had hated all these years. This was a little man, a frightened little man. In this moment, all his money and all his power couldn't help him. I thought of the blood the good doctor had given me. He didn't know I needed it to kill a man. And suddenly, suddenly the white heat of anger, the stubborn purpose which had filled me, dissolved. And, and I knew I couldn't kill him. For the same reason, I couldn't kill anyone. I couldn't take God's work into my own hands. I've won, haven't I, Clyde? Yes. You didn't know that you no longer had your gun, did you? What? It dropped out of your pocket back on the mountainside when you tripped and fell. Well, well what's the matter with you, Clyde? Who are you talking to? You mean I... I don't have it? No, Clyde. Clyde, look at me. Here, behind you. You're crazy, Peters. Plain crazy. No crazy man's going to kill me. Mr. Mr. Bedero. There's no more pain. It's all quiet now, isn't it, Clyde? I'm so glad you finally got my name right. Thomas! Thomas, what's up? We heard shots. Oh. Hey, who's that on the floor? Clyde. Clyde Peters. 
Judge, you know him. He threatened me. I had to do it. You shot him with your rifle. Yeah. What do you mean he threatened you? With what? Makes sense, Tom. I don't see his gun. He has it. He threatened me. Well, he's dead. Poor Clyde. I never believed he was guilty of that embezzlement thing either. Judge, don't you believe me? It was self-defense, I tell you. He was going to shoot me, so I had to shoot him. Self-defense? With a bullet in his back? His gun. It must be there. He has no gun. There's nothing in his pockets. No gun? Listen, Judge, I tell you he was... This is one thing you won't get out of, Thomas. You invited me here to explain some of your other actions. But this tops them all. This time, I'll have the facts to go by. But he did! I tell you, he threatened... What's the matter? Who's that? Who's who? I don't see anyone. Right there. Where did you come from? I'll be seeing you, Tanway. Well, Clyde, whatever Mr. Bitterow was, or whatever you thought he was, he made this story end his way, didn't he? And Clyde... You can thank heaven for that. This is Jack Haley again. You know, I think we're all convinced that the American way of life is the best there is. We, w we wouldn't trade it for anything. The American way of life is based on a lot of beliefs. Beliefs in things like democracy and freedom. But deeper than that, the American way of life is based on individuals. People like you and me. And us? We're the products of our families. So you can see that a happy family is an important part of America. Not having a happy family is the most... <laughs> Now having a happy family is the most wonderful thing in the world, but it's not the easiest thing, not by a long shot. Having and keeping a happy family is a mighty hard job, but you can get help with that job. All you have to do is ask for it. Ask God sincerely and honestly to help you with your problems, to guide you in your decisions. You'll never know how much it helps to try it. So pray. Pray together with your family tonight and every night. A family that prays together stays together. God can help you, and he will. You can depend on it. Before saying goodnight, I'd like to thank Chester Morris for his performance as Clyde and Cecil Kellaway for his portrayal of Mr. Bilderbo. And a special word of thanks also to Celie Glester and Merwin Gerard for writing tonight's play to Mel Wil Williamson for his direction, and to Meredith Wilson for his music. Others who appeared in our play tonight were Ann Morrison, Earl Ross, Betty Arnold, Jack Mather, Bill Boucher, Riff Barnett, and Francis X. Bushman. Next week, our family theater stars will be Alan Jones and Susan Peters. Good night, and God bless you. This series of the Family Theatre broadcast is made possible by the thousands of you who felt the need for this kind of program, by the mutual broadcasting system which has responded to this need, and by the actors and technicians in the motion picture and radio industries who have volunteered their services to fulfill it. This program is heard overseas through the facilities of the United States Armed Forces Radio Services. Tony Lofrano speaking. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System.